Hello, I am Magdalena Kaiser, Director of Public Relations for BQA Wines of Ontario, uh, providing resources and knowledge on behalf of the industry. Welcome today to VQA Cabernet Franc 1.0. This session is uh, a part of an exciting series of webinars that hopefully you've already been watching, uh, featuring VQA Wines of Ontario star varieties. And today is Cabernet Franc. Hopefully you would have seen some of the past sessions on Chardonnay, Riesling, and Pinot Noir, and coming up soon is Gamay Noir as well. So with these sessions, we uh, really are hoping to have you find out and discover some of the key flavor characteristics that are really unique about Ontario Cabernet Franc. It's the most planted red uh, grape in Ontario, so something really important for our industry um, and something very exciting. Also, you will learn about different wine styles within the category and uh, some really fun food and pairing ideas. And then, of course, most importantly, is also meeting the makers from Ontario. So today, I want to welcome back Peter Rod, uh, again, one of Canada's top wine educators and hugely passionate and knowledgeable about Ontario VQA wine. And he will be leading us through some interviews with Walter, uh, from Peely Island Winery, Catherine from Sandbanks Estate Winery, Craig McDonald from Wayne Gretzky Estates, Daniel Speck from Henry of Pelham, Mark Bradshaw from Stroom Winery, and Alan Jackson from Generations Wine Company. So without further ado, uh, again, happy to welcome back Peter Rod. Take us through an exciting session. Thank you, Magdalena. Delightful to be back again, uh, doing what I love most talking about wine, teaching people about wine, um, and very excited to have this great lineup of, of winery representatives to introduce their six Cabernet Francs as well. We, we have some pure varietal Cabernet Francs and we have some really great blends as well. So you're gonna get the full spectrum uh, of the Cabernet Franc story by the time we are finished here. Um, as we like to do at the beginning of these sessions, we always like to show you a picture of a, uh, uh, the appropriate vineyard to get you kind of feeling all warm inside, you know, how beautiful the Ontario wine producing regions are. Uh, this is uh, Lake Erie North Shore looking out over Lake Erie um, and looking late in the season with those protective nets to keep the, uh, the pesky starlings and other things away as we just wrap up the, uh, the ripening. So, we are going to travel to all three of the primary appellations in Ontario today. We have wines from all three, which is exciting. And uh, as the winery representatives tell the story of each wine, uh, you will hopefully be able to pick up on some of the uh, regional influences, the regional terroir that, that causes each of these wines to be unique and distinctive and a little different from each other. Um, my my, my, I don't believe that any of the wines are specifically designated with a sub-appellation today, but obviously the wineries are sourcing their fruit from specific vineyards uh, spread throughout the, the, the three primary wine appellations. And uh, in some cases, uh, the majority of the fruit may be coming from one of these specific sub-appellations. Um, so as I've said in the past, it's always good to get to know these 11 sub-appellations a little bit of a sense of what makes each unique and what you can expect from a particular grape variety grown in each of these appellations. They've been around since 2006, so uh, we have officially 14 years uh, of experience with these uh, sub-appellations and we're starting to see um, a lot of common themes that have emerged as we taste a range of say Riesling or Chardonnay or Pinot Noir or Cabernet Franc from Creatures versus Four Mile Creek versus Beansville Bench, et cetera. Um, and that's, that's the whole point of these sub-appellations is to have that really specific uh, kind of micro identity um, that can be a useful selling tool when you're talking to your customers about regional styles. Uh, again, I don't believe we have any single vineyard designated Cabernet Franc today, uh, but that is certainly something that you will find in Ontario VQA uh, Cabernet Franc as you look at the full range of wines that are available at the LCBO in both the wines category and in vintages, uh, you will notice that the, the single vineyard designate is sometimes used um, for all the aforementioned regions, reasons because it's, a, it's an important um, 
story for the winery. It's an important part of the marketing and the storytelling, but more than that, it, it really speaks to the contents of the bottle. It talks about the characteristics that, uh, that you can expect to enjoy in the bottle, that what aromatically, flavor, texture, all of these things that come from the place that we grow these grapes. The Latitude Lakes and Limestone story um, is just as important for Cabernet Franc as it is for any other grape variety. Um, interesting, if you think about classic Cabernet Franc from around the world, I would argue that the two places that come to mind first, if we're thinking of other benchmark regions for Cabernet Franc other than Ontario, and certainly we are becoming, have become a benchmark region for this grape variety, but maybe uh, if we're looking back to the old world, we may think of a place like uh, Bordeaux uh, for blended Cabernet Franc first. Um, and we might think of the central Loire Valley, uh, specifically the village of Chinon, uh, which is also very famous for Cabernet Franc. And in, in the case of Chinon, pure varietal Cabernet Franc, in the case of Bordeaux, blended uh, Cabernet Franc. And the reason I mention these two regions is because their latitudes interestingly, are actually further north than ours. Uh, Bordeaux sits at about uh, Saint-Emilion, the village of Saint-Emilion, where it really is the epicenter of Cabernet Franc production on the right bank of the Gironde River in Bordeaux, is uh, sitting at about 45 degrees north. And Chinon, further north uh, in the Loire Valley, is sitting at about 47 degrees north of the equator. So if customers are asking you about Ontario and they're wondering about, you know, our coolness, you can always remind them that we're actually closer to the equator. We're, we're theoretically warmer um, through the growing season uh, than a, a, these aforementioned places based purely on the fact that we're sitting between 41 and 44 degrees north of the equator. I think something important to note. Um, no need to get into the lake story. If you've already watched the Riesling and Chardonnay uh, uh, sessions or any of the other sessions that we've done previously, you will, you will know the story of the lakes and the importance that, uh, important role that they play in uh, moderating and stabilizing the climate that we have in, uh, in Ontario, in the various wine growing regions. Um, limestone, again, still remains the base soil for our wine growing regions. And uh, again, to make sort of interesting world comparisons, it also is a very important uh, soil type in the central Loire Valley. Uh, limestone is quite common. It comes in the form of tufo, uh, which is a sort of softer, almost uh, carvable, malleable um, limestone soil. And then we do see pockets of limestone on the right bank in Bordeaux as well, where Cabernet Franc is grown quite heavily. Um, it's mixed with gravel and, um, uh, and clay soils. And interestingly, here we are in Ontario with a very similar mix of soils, all based on that limestone kind of um, bedrock uh, and very sort of degrees of fractured limestone that we'll find mixed with these other soil types we've mentioned. And let's not forget for a minute that when we're talking about Great Chinon, we're talking about uh, 65 $70 wines. When we're talking about the best of Bordeaux, we're in the thousands of dollars. And yet we have the same quality of wine growing area as these places have and the wines we're producing are often a fraction of that price but we do cover a full range so i always like to go back to the value equation which is really important to the story so let's talk a little bit about the grape variety itself cabernet franc um you know it, unfortunately historically it probably has sat a little in the shadow of Cabernet Sauvignon. People have for decades been uh, very, very fond of Cabernet Sauvignon and sometimes overlook Cabernet Franc. And this has always been a head scratcher for me, to be quite honest, because while I understand great Cabernet Sauvignon might be um, a little more structured, a little more age worthy at its very, very best version, Great Cabernet Franc is as pleasing a red wine as Great Cabernet Sauvignon is. It has very similar qualities. It has a lot of the mix of kind of red fruits and dark fruits. Uh, it has, uh, depending on where it's grown, the vintage quality, if it's a cooler, damper year, uh, or if there's a, a, a heavier crop load in the vineyard, we might find some more of those herbal and uh, uh, green vegetal notes, some of the bell pepper, the kind of cut green pepper notes. If it's grown in a warmer vintage or if we're cropping at lower total yields in the vineyard, and these are very simple generalized comparisons, but they do 
potentially play a role, then we start to see more of the concentrated fruit, um, even the kind of, um, you know, plum compote and jammy notes that we can sometimes get in the really warm vintages, which we're having quite a number of these days. Uh, we're just coming through another of those beautifully warm vintages in 2020 and really looking forward to see what the Cabernet Franc is going to taste like uh, this year. And then, of course, we can add oak into the blend, and that brings on this beautiful uh, additional range of spice notes, uh, clove and sort of sweet baking spices. We get some of those light char notes, depending on what type of oak barrel and, and the level of toast and how long the wine is spent in oak. And that beautiful chocolatey, that kind of milk chocolatey uh, cocoa note that can be very, very pleasant and is a beautiful partner to the red and dark fruits that we're seeing in these wines already. Um, we make the full range in Ontario VQA, uh, Cabernet Franc, not only single varietal, but also blended. Uh, and some very light, friendly, juicy, easy drinking wines um, that really are meant to be purchased and consumed in, you know, uh, in fairly short order. Uh, but we also make some fairly powerful, structured uh, wines with more tannin, more acidity, perhaps a little more oak influence that can be cellared and aged for extended periods of time. And then finally, uh, you know, the great news is one of the most unique expressions of Cabernet Franc in this part of the world is our extraordinary red ice wines. And um, this is something we've been, been doing for longer than you may think now. It feels like a relatively new style, but in fact, Red ice wines have been something we've been specializing in for a number of years now. And uh, it's a, Cabernet Franc has certainly emerged as, as the king of the reds in terms of the consistency, uh, the flavor profile, just how delicious and complex and wonderful that grape variety is in, uh, in the form of ice wine. Uh, we also make a lot of really good rosé, not unlike what you'd experience rosé in the Loire Valley. You'd see an awful lot of rosé produced in that part of France. And they would be, in a lot of cases, made from the Cabernet Franc variety. It's a variety that's just suitable for rosé. It gives us all of that attractive aromatic and flavor profile, the beautiful fruit first with the nuance and the complexity and just the right amount of acid and tannin to give the wine a little bit structure. So we can, we can have some fairly serious dry rosés and we can also have some very friendly sort of light fruity, floral, summery rosés that might have a tiny bit of uh, fruity sweetness to them as well. So when should we think about serving Cabernet Franc? Well, uh, as we've said with all the other varieties, the, the key word here is, is what do you want to do? Uh, if you're just having a simple uh, friend with uh, friends over, a, a light, simple meal with friends, or you're doing a, just, you haven't sort of pulled out all the stops, and gone deep into the uh, into the cookbook for the most complex meals, and we're really looking at simple things like pasta night, or we've got pizza, uh, or we've got very simple grilled uh, items in the barbecue. Cabernet Franc can be a great partner to that. Uh, it, it is crowd pleasing. Uh, we just have to find the style that we think is going to be most suitable for the for the group of friends that we're inviting. And in fact, we've got six wines today that I think are absolutely perfect for that kind of occasion. Um, uh, you know, and then at the opposite end of the spectrum, we have those more serious occasions where we're looking to wow friends, family, maybe it's a date night, a special date night, or, you know, we're meeting the in-laws for the first time, and we're trying to find that glorious food pairing to go with the special food that we prepared. In this case, lamb, a spectacular match, um, because there's this, there's this a subtle, gamey, um, really attractive, almost animal note to some Cabernet Franc which naturally creates an affinity to uh, things like lamb, uh, duck, certain beef dishes, uh, other sort of game meats can be a really nice pairing with, uh, with Cab Franc. And we're coming into the fall season. Some of you might uh, know hunters or might be hunters yourselves. And certainly this is a beautiful varietal to go, especially in the kind of ripe, softer versions to go with venison or uh, whatever it else, moose, in fact, if you're, if you're cooking with moose. And then we've got the ice wine, which is a beautiful uh, pairing with our sweet desserts. I always like to say, don't make sure that the wine is a little bit sweeter than the dessert, um, because we, we don't want to strip the wine of its, its fruitiness and its attractive kind of lush sweetness. We want to make sure we preserve that. And, uh, and so think of maybe tart fruit desserts, 
Um, we have such beautiful fruit in Niagara, and frankly, Cabernet Franc ice wine is beautiful with any of it, um, but especially with maybe our, our berry fruits, um, peaches, strawberries, some of our tree fruits, plums, absolutely. And then of course, wine and cheese. You know, you can never go wrong with the classic wine and cheese pairing, but just randomly picking cheeses to go with your wines is not maybe going to, to result in the kind of glorious pairings that you're hoping. It's not a simple case of saying, I've got cheese, I've got wine, I put the two together, it's always gonna work. We wanna get a little more specific in our pairings. And so um, Doug Beattie and the Wine Marketing Association has done such wonderful work picking specific pairings to go with each of the different styles, expressions of Cabernet Franc that we produce in Ontario. And this is just a summary of five that are particularly delicious. You know, we're looking at blue cheeses as a possibility, especially with our sweeter ice wines, because we get that sweet, salty uh, com uh, comparison. And we also get richness in both of the products. Um, and then aged cheeses like our cheddars, some of our uh, firmer aged goat cheese and sheep's milk cheese are also very good. And, um, you know, the general rule is if you're serving red wines, you typically want to go into something that's a little, old, a little older, a little drier in the mouth, not as fatty, not as sticky. So uh, without further ado, I think it probably uh, is a great time to uh, introduce the first of our winery representatives and the first wine we're gonna taste today, just to give you a little bit of a sense of some of the things we've been talking about in the introduction. And uh, we'll kick things off with uh, Peely Island, 2018 Cabernet Franc. Uh, we've been delighted to have Peely Island as part of some of our sessions uh, earlier. It certainly is a wonderful winery with incredible history um, and an amazing diverse range of products. Uh, lots to do and see on the island and at the facility and lots to taste. And we have Walter Schmarantz with us. Uh, honored to have you here with us, Walter. Thanks for joining us. Look Thank forward you, to Peter. this Thanks wine. Thanks for having me. Peter, it's, it's a pleasure to talk about Cabernet Franc. Uh, if I tell you that I'm allowed to do a little bit of winemaking, most everything else here in the winery since 1985. Cabernet Franc, I'm sorry to tell you, it was not the first variety we had in red here. It was more the, uh, the Gamays and the Pinot Noirs. But we started very seriously in the early 90s to import actually directly Cabernet Franc from uh, a grower, like a nursery in France. So we have uh, a bunch of different clones, Cabernet Franc on Pili Island since the early 90s. Most of them are on an SO4, that's a rootstock or 3309. And uh, listening to introductory, I, I totally agree. Cabernet Franc is the totally undervalued and, and not so famous uh, Bordeaux variety. And I think that is a variety, may I say so, what really gives Bordeaux the name because I really believe that the comparison to Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, or Cabernet, Cabernet Franc has the ability to gracefully age much nicer so than Cap Sauv or Merlot. And I believe without Cabernet Franc, Bordeaux, Bordeaux would never get the famous name they, they absolutely deserve and have. So our Cabernet Franc, like I said, planted in the early 90s, a variety most uh, viticulturists like a lot because it's up upright growing and so it's a variety fairly easy to handle in a in a trellis system and uh, it is uh, if you look at the the habit of the plant a little bit more petit than the Cabernet Sauvignon the leaves are a little bit smaller but the, the nice and and for sure outstanding part of it is the uprightness of the variety so we absolutely enjoy to grow it on Pili Island. Upright. That's interesting. I've not heard that term um, celebrated in quite the same way. What, what specifically, what benefits specifically is that giving you as the grower and, and how is that going to lead to higher quality in the glass? Like you, you understand most of modern viticulture uh, is involved in, in some type of a wire system. So the, the grapes are trained into, a, we call them a catch wires maybe uh, four or sometimes five pairs of them, like the pairs means four to five, six wires. And uh, if I may say this particular one coming up through the growing season is easy to maintain in that, in that system, in that upright uh, trellis system. And uh, so it gives you the perfect exposure to light. It gives you also the, if it grows so nicely upright and it gives you the, the wind 
like the wind does is what it's supposed to do, dry up the plants early on in the day. And it's easy to hatch if you have to hatch it. And so we think the, the productivity, the production from, from assimilation from, from uh, chlorophyll into sugar is perfect. And I, we believe it's, it's easier to work with if you have to handle it. It's easier to work. You get, you are more productive in the vineyard with Cabernet Franc than you, for example, would be with a vineyard called uh, Chardonnay or, or even uh, Pinot Noir, may I say so. Okay, very interesting. That's a, a nice tidbit to, uh, to add to the discussion as well. Um, if, you're, if you're serving this Cab Franc at home, Walter, what sort of foods are you having with it? I, I think you, you explained it quite nicely. Uh, the, the array is endless, but the, the stylistically, these wines can be tremendously different, like from a light, very fruity, uh, fruit-driven rosé to a medium-styled, uh, uh, not as tannic red wine to if you select it out and if you bleed it a little bit to some very independent and massive red wines who are aged easily for 10 to 12 years. So I would say, you, I, I like the game you mentioned. I like the aged cheeses. And be honest, I, I have nothing wrong with a homemade uh, dark bread, even a rye bread. And you could try it with the tomatoes and the onions and roast it a little bit. And I think it goes very well with that. Beautiful. Sounds good. I'm sure everybody's writing down ideas right now and are going to rush home and, and uh, sample that this evening. Well, I'm glad this wine is widely available and everybody will have a chance to do just that. Try the wine and food pairings and experience it for yourself. Thanks, Walter, for joining us and for introducing us to your Cabernet Franc. Thanks for inviting me, Peter. Pleasure. So next, uh, we'll take the, um, the long drive, some would say, uh, from the north shore of Lake Erie, or the island specifically of Pelee Island, and uh, make our way all the way up to the northeastern corner of Lake Ontario and Prince Edward County, uh, where we find Sandbanks, a state winery, and um, delighted to have Catherine Langlois with us uh, from Sandbanks to introduce her 2018 Cabernet Franc. Catherine, welcome. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's an honor to be here and I have to tell you I'm slightly intimidated because uh, I used to work for Walter from Pili Island Winery before I started Sandbanks Winery. So uh, nothing by being put on the spot right after uh, your mentor. So I'm here to feature uh, Sandbanks Cabernet Franc. Uh, I, I hope it's not too echoey. I'm in the uh, barrel cellar. So I actually uh, ran away from the vineyard this morning. It's an exciting day at Sandbanks. Uh, we just started, started the harvest of the uh, baco of our red grapes. So the Cab Franc is not quite uh, ready yet. I brought some grapes actually, <laughs> if you wanted yeah. to see. So this is a baco, uh, a baco bunch. And I don't know if you can see the color on the screen. This is a Cab Franc. So the Cab Franc's got still a little ways to go. Um, amazing grape growing year. Uh, it's, I don't know um, in your area, but here in the county, we had almost eight weeks without rain. So it was very hard for um, classic farming, but uh, as far as grape growing, it did give us uh, a lot of sugar. So the sunshine and it's a bright sunny day today. So it's a, uh, it's exciting day. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, I'm, I'm sipping the wine as we're talking and I'm really enjoying it. I think it's, uh, it's got that kind of that lovely um, little bit of everything, if I may say. You know, overall a fairly light wine, but there are some nice fine tannins there. There is a, a, an attractive sort of dose of, uh, of fruity kind of sweetness in the end to make it really kind of lush and approachable. Um, any particular tricks that you used? I mean, you're standing in the barrel cellar. Is there, is there much wood on this wine at all? Does that add to any uh, structure I'm feeling? Uh, there, there is a bit. I, I have to admit, actually, Cabernet Franc is not uh, our best-selling wine, but it is my uh, favorite. So uh, I often explain it as if it's like the little brother of Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it's not as muscular. It's not, you know, as, as big but it's way more charming, uh, which I really, really enjoy in a wine. So most of our wines are, are fruit driven and uh, some, some have ageability. Um, so we make 
So the, the Cabernet Franc that we're featuring today is uh, instilled in closure, so it's more to be enjoyed, you know, tonight with some pasta. Uh, we make it in a more ageable uh, version, blended with some cab also. It's called uh, French Kiss. I don't choose the names, by the way. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it, some of it is uh, fermented in stainless and then some seeds a little bit of uh, European oak as well. Okay, yeah, absolutely delicious. Um, now, what about service temperatures? Is that something that you like to advise the LCBO staff about a wine like this? Would you like to see it at room temperature, slightly cool? What are your thoughts? Uh, because it's on the lighter berry side, you have a lot of raspberry, red currant, uh, smooth, fine tannins. I like to chill, chill it a little bit. So when I say a little bit, that might just be 20 minutes in the fridge uh, if you don't have a cellar. And uh, yeah, enjoy it with your favorite, uh, favorite people. Awesome. Well, that's great. I'm, I don't know if people are seeing, but I'm using a nice big uh, sort of a tall, slim glass. Which, which is very close to, yeah, as, as are you, um, which is quite close to the sort of classic uh, Riedel design glass for Bordeaux varietals. And I have to admit, if I compare that glass to, um, to even a little ISO glass, which has the same idea, but is a much smaller volume, um, it's amazing how the larger glass transforms the wine and allows the aromas uh, to fully express themselves. So. I highly recommend uh, that people consider a slightly bigger glass, uh, maybe even a bigger pour while you're at it, uh, if you're drinking this Cabernet Franc and, and allow the wine to really express itself. And you know, watch it change as it goes from that slightly cool temperature that Catherine has recommended uh, and warms up to room temperature and gets aerated and expresses all of its, uh, all of its character. Thank you, Catherine, for joining us and uh, good luck with the rest of your harvest. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. And as I have the audience from the LCBO here, thank you so much for your support all through the years. I uh, greatly appreciate it and promote VQA. Hey, we're all in this together. Yeah, Cheers. well said, well said. I think you speak on behalf of the entire group today. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. So next we'll, we'll shift to the third of the primary wine growing regions and that is of course Niagara Peninsula where I am sitting right now. Uh, I'm uh, right in the Creek Shores sub-Appalachian uh, is where I'm based, my home, my home office as it were. Um, and uh, if we were to travel a little bit east uh, and a little bit south, we'd find ourselves passing uh, on the main road straight to Niagara on the Lake. We would be driving by one of Ontario's relatively newer gorgeous wineries and that's the Wine Gretzky estate um, which I have been to on a number of occasions. Uh, it's, it's a great winery and, and a great tourism uh, experience frankly. You guys have done quite a job Craig of creating uh, a little something for everybody at this, uh, this venue but you're here, here today to tell us a little bit about the Cabernet Merlot 2019. Craig McDonald, welcome. Hey Pete, how you doing mate? Good, nice to see you again. Good to see you too pal. I guess that's my cue to talk about Cabernet Franc. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> tell us, tell us about this wine. <laughs> Have a little fun. Yeah, well, actually, it's funny because when I first came to Canada 20 years ago, um, I was actually quite scared of Cabernet Franc. Um, being an Australian, we don't grow a whole lot down there. And it's a tricky one to grow because it, it doesn't like, it needs heat, but not too much heat. And it'll get a lot of sugar accumulation and alcohol without flavor. So you've all heard of the, you know, the concept of hang time. We don't always have that luxury uh, in Canada, but uh, what we do have is a perfect amount of heat and a really good balance between the, you know, the, the physiological ripeness of the, of the berry and the bunch itself and the flavor development. So that was a real learning curve for me because uh, when I first came, there's a lot of Cabernet Franc and I had not much experience with it, but um, 20 years later, it's become one of my favorite wines. And um, uh, it, even in the, the previous wines that we just tried uh, by itself, but I, I think it works particularly well in blends as well. So, and th this one here is the Gretzky um, Cab Merlot, Cabernet Merlot, meaning a blend of Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. Um, what I like about Cabernet Franc, Pete, and you'd know, you, you actually said it earlier, you know, if you think of Cabernet Sauvignon as being dark and intense and quite tannic, and then having Merlot as being the, the juicy pillow you rest your head on and it's very fruit forward. 
there's a, there's a great play in the middle, and then Walter mentioned it too, about Cabernet Franc playing an important link between those two. And it adds that beautiful um, freshness, uh, savoury notes. Um, it's a great ambassador in between those two. And I think it really um, ties blends well together. So it's a great synergy. And you can't do, I've tried Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot together, and it's just always something missing. So I think that's where Cabernet Franc uh, does its job. Interesting. When, you, when you're making a decision to use Cabernet Franc for a blend versus a pure varietal wine, are, are there implications that, you know, are obvious, things that you, uh, you know, you're thinking about top of mind? Um, or is it always grow the best Cab Franc we can and put it where it belongs? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, um, the, the, I think if people come to, I'll just sort of divert a little bit. If you come to Niagara, now, and if you've been coming here for 20 years, you'll see a massive difference in uh, canopy management and the way that we train and trellis our grapes. Um, and that's really impacted the, um, the flavor development and the quality of Cabernet Franc more than any other variety, I think. Um, when I came here, uh, um, you know, I would say that vineyards were a little more scraggly, a little more shaded, maybe a little heavier uh, crop levels, and the resultant wines were a bit on the green side. Now, I think I think that's part of the character of Cabernet Franc that there's a an herbaceous nature that I absolutely love and if, if you've obviously tried Chinon you would know that um, but um, we've really really improved the uh, concentration of flavor and all the other elements the positive attributes of red wine that um, uh, that we've done in the vineyard first so so yeah we, we really focus on getting it right in the vineyard getting the highest quality Cab Franc and then we sit down you know, as you know, every vintage is different. We sit down and then we come up with the assemblage after the fact. So, but it's always important to do the very best you can from the outset. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that's part of the joy of having been in this region for practically my entire wine life is seeing those evolutions and seeing that learning and experiencing it through the quality of wines that we have. And as I've said in previous sessions, uh, it's yeah. just so easy to drink Ontario wines these days. Ontario VQA is easy. Yeah. The prices are great. The quality continues to, to, not, to notch up and up and up. And there you are explaining exactly why one of the reasons that, you know, that that's happening. And, and that's thanks to 40 years of experience uh, working and seeing how these varieties react in our, in our climate, in our soils, etc. Yeah. And this, this wine here, which apparently I have to do a cameo shot. There you go, Magdalena. Um, that's um, a good example of that, Peter. It's, um, you know, we have a great facility that brings down uh, tourists and uh, everyone that's interested in Niagara. And in fact, some people that aren't even interested in wine come down because of Gretzky. And it's a great way to introduce them to VQA wine. So the Cab Merlot is, is a good example of that. Um, you know, it's on the drier side. I don't know if you've got it in your glass there or not, but it, it shows that um, you know, it has a chewy, uh, lovely uh, sort of density to it. Lots of red currant and plum. Very supple tannins. It's not overly tannic, but very, very smooth and very balanced. And I think that's what people want to see when they're starting out drinking Ontario wines. You know, you don't want to be too dramatic and too polarizing. You want to sort of wean them in. And uh, we've always had that at the forefront of, of uh, the Gretzky uh, mission statement was to sort of introduce people to uh, Ontario wines. So, so that's that's a good example of that, and it's doing extremely well. This is actually the the thirteenth of this wine, if you can imagine. So wow. um, time goes on. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for bringing this delicious blend uh, in, Craig, and um, introducing thanks, introducing the audience to something uh, a little more full bodied and a little more sort of um, intense, but beautifully balanced and still extraordinarily well priced. Thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Cheers. Thanks. So let's shift uh, from the Niagara on the lake side of Niagara to the uh, the west side of St. Catharines and to um, the Short Hills Bench Appalachian where we find Henry of Pelham. We've got uh, Dan Speck joining us. And thank you, Dan, for coming back to tell us the story of yet another delicious wine. In this case, we've got the house wine company, Cabernet Shiraz 2018. Tell us about that, please. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, a house wine company, the mission of these wines when they, uh, they first were launched, and there's, there's several in the portfolio. There's a Cabernet Shiraz, a Riesling Pinot Grigio, a Baco Cabernet Sauvignon. 
was to um, link a regionally uh, uh, strong grape variety, in this case, Cabernet Franc, something that uh, is core to us. But as you know, we, you pointed out earlier on, sometimes it takes a bit of a backseat to Cab Sauvignon, unfortunately, in terms of people's awareness. So it's to kind of link these, these varietals with um, other things that are grown here in a more specialist way and to kind of uh, connect people to the full package of, of what these blends can actually be and, 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 and sort of bring them into the, to the main varietal, which really is here, it's the Cabernet uh, side of it, by which we really mean Cabernet Franc primarily. So, um, but uh, uh, like a few people have said uh, uh, prior, I mean, I think when we think of Cabernet Franc as, as a company, and my brothers and I have always found that, uh, and I, mean, I love Cabernet Franc varietally, uh, but, but we love it a little more, I think, in, in the context of a blend because that, that core of the variety, uh, that, that, that firmness it has, while delicious, I think benefits from a little bit of a juicier variety rounding it out. Just it's, maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a family preference, it's a house preference. So whether it's Henry of Pelham, Cabernet Merlot, or uh, in this case, through the House Wine Company brand, the, the Cabernet Shiraz, we always add in something to kind of round it out. And, and I think it's that, you know, sum is greater than the, uh, or the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts kind of thing. Um, so, the, you know, the price is thirteen ninety five, which once again is just amazing. Um, it does, does, is it easier to achieve that sort of a price point with a blend than it is with a pure varietal in the case Cabernet Franc? Could you, would you, would you be able to produce a wine of this quality from pure Cabernet Franc at 1395 or does the blend give you another sort of set of tool that you get to work with? Uh, and maybe you can explain that to folks because I've always been a huge fan of the blend myself, especially in Ontario. I love what we do. Um, uh, but there's got to be a reason you can get a wine like this in a, in a bottle at 1395. To be honest with you, it really depends on what grape varietals we're working with. Some of them uh, are more or less expensive. Some of them crop at a heavier level or, or whatnot. But uh, actually, the uh, the Cabernet component of this wine, we, we could do this at probably at thirteen ninety five. We could do for sure a Cabernet. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, but you know, there's there's also something to be said for putting it together. I love that. Remember that movie um, uh, Sideways? And in Sideways, you know, it's about the guy loves Pinot Noir and hates Merlot. Um, and then at the very end of the movie. He, out of a big styrofoam cup, he's all depressed and he pours it like a 1960-something Chevelle Blanc, which is, you know, like you said, Saint Emilion. It's a, uh, we always think of it as a, if people are into that wine, would say, oh, it's Cabernet Franc, right? Pours it into the big uh, styrofoam cup and drinks it and, and has it with a burger. And the, the kind of the joke that most people don't get in that movie is that Chevelle Blanc is at least half as low. And, and it's the idea that putting the blend together, and that's the grape variety he's pooping all over through the whole movie. Yet he loves this wine. Cabernet Franc, but in the context of a, a little bit of a, a rounding uh, variety, just again becomes even greater in my view. Right. Yeah, I'm glad you remind me of that of that movie. It's certainly one of my favorites. I, I watch it every year, and that that final scene is is perfect. It really is. Uh, and how how sort of surreptitiously he's pouring it into his thing because he doesn't want anybody to see him in this burger joint. I don't know. It's uh, it's a great way to wrap up up the movie, but. Thanks for, for bringing this wine along and talking a little bit about the, the value of blends and the role that Cabernet Franc can play uh, beside Cab Sauv and Shiraz. Thanks, Dan. Pleasure. Thanks. So we're shifting to, we're staying in Niagara uh, uh, on the lake and we're shifting, um, uh, well, in Niagara, moving back to Niagara on the lake. We're bouncing back and forth uh, from east to west Niagara and we're back to Strun Winery and, and Strun has been with us for some previous sessions and always delighted to, to taste their wines and to talk about their wines, especially when we've got uh, winemaker Mark Bradshaw along for the ride. Mark, tell us about Rogue's Lot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc. Uh, cheers, Peter, and cheers, Magdalena, and thanks again for the, uh, this great opportunity. Um, the Rogue's Lot, uh, shown right here. <clears throat> so um, the idea um, that Struan had with the Rogue's Lot um, it really was to produce a, a fun, um, edgy red blend uh, using um, Cab Franc and Cab Sav. Um, but the aim of the game was um, it had to be seriously enjoyable, but just not over serious. It, it's a great entry level wine and, you know, get people into red wine and just, you know, thoroughly fun, um, enjoyable. Um, and the beauty is, is that, you know, you, you take these 
um, these two cab um, bridles and, and you know you're sticking them together and um, they carry of course you know the, the, the typical cab traits you know you get the, the red berries and the spiciness but you know that you can work that out of the blend which is one of the funnest you know parts of, of wine making for me um, and, and really try and capture some of the, the cab franc nuances as well as the cab sass you know the cab franc you'll, you'll get a bit of that tobacco you'd mentioned and, and some you know, gorgeous um, uh, purple flower, sort of violet notes, um, and sort of intertwine that with some of that, um, you know, eucalyptus you can get on some of the cab sav and, and um, that really sort of intense dark chocolate. And, that, you know, overall it just makes this, um, you know, dynamite wine. Um, and, and, like, personally for me, and now I'm, I'm getting up to, I first came over here in, in 04, um, and as, as Macker had, had alluded to um, previously, you know, I myself as well, well, it was very naive when it came to Cab Franc. It really wasn't until I got to Niagara that I got to play with this bridle. Um, and to be honest, at first I wasn't necessarily the biggest fan, but um, after making it, you know, uh, for a bit, it, it, it's actually a bloody exciting bridle to play with and makes fantastic wines. Um, you know, so it's been, it's been a fun ride. Um, and, and this Rogue's Lot is, is, you know, just a great example of it. Um, you know, pulling the fruit, uh, mainly fermentum in, in uh, one ton bins, um, oak age it. Um, it's all always oak aged. Um, and uh, I use um, American, French and um, also Canadian oak, um, which is a fantastic oak to work with. Um, and so any sort of um, tannin structure you get on there, you want a little bit of tannin structure on this, but nothing too overt or aggressive. So I, I love using sort of older oak and more seasoned oak for, for this sort of wine. Um, and then really it's sort of, you know, as, as, as those other guys have said, you work that out of the blend. Um, I like to have, you know, a very fruit forward wine, um, nice little tangy, tangy tail. So it'll have a sort of a lash of, a lash of lushness on there. Nothing too, nothing too silly, but just to, you know, keep the fun and, you know, up in the wine. Um, and, and as, as I've mentioned to you, uh, previously, you know, for me, the, the end game is, is to make a wine that, that's thoroughly enjoyable. That, that, that at the end of the day, you, you want someone to taste this wine and, and, and come back. You want to you want to repeat customer be it the next glass, the next bottle, whatever it is. Um, so you know that's that's really for me where this wine comes in. You know, it's yeah. a great wine. You have it on its own. You know, outside if you want, or, or pair it with you know burgers. Or, chicken wings, pizza, anything like that, sport on the telly. It just works great with anything like that. That's the first that we've had, the sport on the telly wine pairing. That's awesome. Perfect, perfect match. Um, so, you know, the LSPO, the LSPO reps are bound to get asked from time to time, what does Rogue's Lot refer to? Can you shed some light on that story? So Rogue's Lot was the whole idea. I mean, it was something that, um, that Joe and Jane had sort of come up with the name of Rogue as in, you know, something that's sort of a bit off the wall, a bit edgy, you know, straying off the norm a bit. You know, you can have your, your, your typical, I mean, normally when people think red wines, often they'll think sort of, okay, red wine, serious wine, you know, um, you know, a, a wine that you sort of will have and you're going to sit there and, you know, you're going to have your glass and swirl it around and, you know, taking the aromatics and the expected to really sort of think and break down the wine. So the whole idea of the road was to sort of move away from that, make it, you can do that if you want, but at the end of the day, this is just a great wine to sit and enjoy. No muss, no fuss, um, serious, but, but not over serious. I mean, this is, you know, sit back and, and just enjoy the wine, you know, and enjoy, you know, who's around you, sunshine outside, stuff like that. Yeah. So we, we could almost replace Rogue with every man, actually, because it sounds like something that you've built for the, for the, uh, for, for, you don't have to be a Rogue necessarily, uh, but you can be somebody who, uh, you know, is just looking, as you say, for a wine with some structure, a wine with a little bit of attitude, but a wine that's still beautifully, uh, you know, supple and, and, and dive great with a diverse range of, uh, uh, of foods. I, I love what you've done with it. Um, I, I love the little, there's a warmth to this wine that I hadn't had in the previous wines. Um, and I think maybe that speaks a bit to the American oak, the Canadian oak. There's just this beautiful light spicing, uh, which gives it that tanginess and that bit of, of pep. And I think maybe even expands 
some of the, the food possibilities as well because of that beautiful spicy note and a great compliment to the, the red fruits and the rose hip and the tea leaf. And so it's quite an interesting wine and a lot going on in this glass. Cheers. Thank you, mate. Yeah. No, it, it, it works great. And, you know, I mean, let's be honest, there's a little bit of rogue in all of us. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it's really a good reflection of everyone here, like you said. I love it. Un unleash the rogue, says Mark Bradshaw. Exactly right. Thanks. Thanks for coming, mate. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Good to see you again. Cheers. All right. So uh, we're going to wrap things up with uh, a, a wonderful wine with a great story, a really great story from uh, the Generations Wine Company. And uh, delighted to have Alan Jackson with us. And Alan will tell us a little bit more about the company and his partner, as we can see here in the, in the photo. Um, but we're all very much looking forward to the story of Don't Poke the Bear. Are you the bear, Alan? Are you the bear? Well, I guess I am. <laughs> uh, we're, in fact, that picture is appropriate because Generations Winery, which most of you probably haven't heard of, is a two-person winery. There's only, we have no employees. I look after everything to do with winemaking and production. And my partner, Andrew von Teichmann, looks after everything to do with sales, marketing, and administration. So we introduced the brand Don't Poke the Bear, which is following on the Rogues brand. It's a whimsical brand. It, it's fun. And uh, it was in, introduced three years ago and has roared in popularity to the point where it's now the second biggest selling BQA red in the LCPO system. And there's about to be more of it because it, we're moving into a three liter bag and box that should be available in the uh, system in early November. We knew it's a dual varietal Baco Cabernet. We knew when we developed the brand that it was going to be dual varietal and it was going to be Baco. So the first thing I did was search for a, another varietal which would be complementary to the Baco and uh, quickly settle on Cabernet Franc because it uh, it's a marriage made in heaven, I would say, with Baco Noir. It, I was actually looking for something to tone down some of the characters in Baco, and uh, Baco is very intense in color, in body, and in fruit characters. But in Cab, the uh, tobacco, herbal, smoky notes just combine beautifully with the Baco to, to give you a nice overall impact in the end. And uh, as you can see from the name and the label, it, it's a fairly whimsical brand. It's, it, it, it's not meant to be, you know, a fine wine. In fact, it's got almost a cult following in some place. We've had a couple of customers get the, the likeness of the bear, including the eye patch tattooed on them. So not something we encourage, but they went out and did that on their own. <laughs> Unusual, right? Yeah. Um, so, so, and I, I, I particularly like the, uh, the, the use of punctuation in don't. Um, you're, you're, you're clearly waving the Ontario flag there. Is that, is that yeah. the yeah. Good, good catch, Peter. The don't is D apostrophe O-N-T to emphasize that it's Ontario BQA as opposed to normally you'd see D-O-N apostrophe T. But we are uh, BQA Ontario because Baco Noir, of course, is a hybrid and that makes you a, a BQA Ontario as opposed to a sub-appellation. In fact, we're a virtual winery, which is to say people aren't familiar with that term. We don't have our own winery. We have two host wineries where we produce, we lease tanks and use their equipment to produce, there's a good many precursors in the world. The two most famous ones are Kim Crawford of New Zealand and early on Wolf Blast of Australia. So we uh, have gone that route. Both our host wineries are in on the Beamsville bench and we have contractual grape agreements with four uh, vineyard estate wineries where we uh, produce our wine and then get it into the bottle. So as a, we're just working on our fourth vintage now. So we know exactly the profile we want and uh, that's where we're headed. 
it's a, as I said, food wise, my, my comments would be pizza, pasta and burgers. And, and also it's just a nice glass of wine to have if you want a glass of wine in the evening to just relax. Yeah, um, it, it really is, uh, it does fit the bill in all regards and you've done a nice job of uh, finding a partner for Baco. Uh, I think that we still get some of the, the pleasant Baco characteristics there. Some of the herbal notes, uh, the, the depth of color as you mentioned, but the Cabernet Franc really just uh, adds a juiciness and a freshness and a, and a kind of a, a roundness to the blend. Um, and I, the 13 grams of sugar is a very strategic uh, addition as well and makes it really very approachable and, and very pleasing. Um, a wine to be drunk quite young. Is this something that you imagine, have you had a chance to try earlier vintages of this and see how it evolves in bottle or are you really, that's not something you're encouraging people to do. Have it with tonight's hamburger and enjoy it fresh. Well, that, that's a really good question, Peter. I, I've been monitoring it obviously over the three vintages so far and into the fourth now. Uh, customer wise, we can't really say because it's been selling so quickly. We, we've never had a chance really for most of our customers to accumulate them and do much in the way of vertical tasting. The one comment I'd like to make about Cab Franc, which I, I don't think we've got to yet today, two big positives about Cabernet Franc, especially relative to Cabernet Sauvignon are it's an earlier ripener by, about, by several weeks earlier ripening for Cabernet Franc. So that assures us each year of having fully ripe Cabernet Franc, which is something we can't always say about Cab Sauvignon because it's quite a bit lighter in a cool year. We don't quite get there. So it's more reliable in terms of its characteristics year by year. The other good thing about it, it's a little bit more cold hardy than cap soap, which of course for growers, they like it. We've touched on it. It, it is very vigorous cap front, more vigorous than cap soap, you know. It can be too vigorous in that uh, it's capable of producing 10 tons per acre, whereas you want to be more than four or five tons per acre range. And I think that has kind of impacted cap front not being as popular as we might have anticipated it would be, because as it was introduced to, to uh, new grape and wine regions, uh, learning how to harness it and, and tone down that, that uh, vigorousness was a challenge early on. But we've mastered that now in Ontario. And I've seen the same issues pop up in the Okanagan and in Washington state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly we, we've, we talk about the vigor of this variety, uh, like Sauvignon Blanc on, our, on a regular basis. And, uh, I, I do agree that uh, the Cabernet Franc across the range that we're producing in the region is much, much better because we're, 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 not, we're not poking the bear and we're maybe even taming the bear a little bit. Uh, you know, if, <laughs> if Cab Franc is the bear who wants to grow wild and go wild, uh, we've learned to tame it gently a little bit and get the best out of it. So uh, we're making a friendlier bear than we ever were before. Well, Any that, that's the intention. Yeah, yeah. Any uh, other uh, important notes that you want to mention about this wine to help uh, LCBO product consultants uh, boost sales, even though you're very happy with the way things are going? Uh, well, it's reliable and it's consistent and it's a nice glass of wine and that's the objective. It does not have cork and it does not have oak. Uh, both Andrew and I are alumni of Jackson Triggs, so we from the time we we started up doing our own labels, it's all been screw cap, and we felt feel that that's the future, and we want to stay there. Other interesting factoid about Cab Franc, we've talked a little bit about sometimes the vegetal grassy characters popping up. It's interesting; those are first cousins of the same components in New Zealand uh, Sauvignon Blanc, the the gooseberry asparagus characters. They're very closely related. And, and actually, when you, if you had a glass side by side, you would see that. Fortunately, if at any time during the summer, the vineyard temperatures get to 35 Celsius or higher, those characters actually metabolize into nice characters, not, not that kind of annoying grassy character. So, and with global warming, that 
hasn't been a problem for the last many years. Yes, yeah. Oh, good to know. So let's leave it with that. Cabernet Franc, in the case of Don't Poke the Bear, and I think, frankly, every wine we've had today is reliable, it's consistent, and it's delicious. And I think those are three great words to leave with our product consultants uh, as we wrap up the session on, on these wines. Thanks, Alan, for joining us. And give our best to Andrew, please. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. So that's it for me. Uh, and we just want to wrap things up by saying how much fun I've had doing these sessions. I hope you have a chance to watch them all. I hope they help you a great deal. Uh, and as was echoed earlier in the session, uh, thanks everybody for all the great work you do promoting Ontario VQA wines uh, from all the wonderful uh, producers that we have and all the great, great varieties that, that we're growing. So I'll pass it over to you, Magdalena, to finish things up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much for bringing us through another exciting session with Cabernet Franc, uh, which brings us to the end of this uh, series of the 1.0. Uh, thank you very much for uh, interviewing uh, these exciting and fun sessions with the producers that came out today to talk about their wines and their wineries and uh, specifically about Cabernet Franc, uh, especially now considering it's busy harvest time, very early for Ontario this year. So lots of uh, action happening already. And thank you again to all of the viewers who have tuned in uh, at the LCBO. We really appreciate your support uh, and your commitment to education, knowledge, and service. It's so important to us in Ontario and uh, um, especially the Ontario wine industry. So again, VQA equals certified 100% Ontario grown. And this is, is really, really important for us all to remember because if VQA is not on the bottle, then, then that's not the case. And uh, that message is more important than ever. Uh, right now, uh, local is, is so, so important for everyone living in Ontario. It's, it's essentially the most sustainable choice for Ontarians. And uh, you, we can see that in the numbers. Uh, it contributes to over 18,000 jobs across many sectors in Ontario. It also, uh, for every single bottle that a consumer purchases, um, they, they vote with their purchase. $98.20 goes back into the Ontario economy. So that is, is so important to everyone and uh, very compelling. The value proposition too though is something that we can't forget. Ontario uh, really produce, we produce world-class wines and we produce them uh, in a sustainable way and we produce them with um, great value uh, in listening to all of the, uh, the wine pairings that people were talking about in this session. Um, the price points um, from the wines that were presented today are, are just uh, incomparable to many places in the world. So uh, we always wanna remember that. And uh, if we go to the next slide, um, one final comment is to remember that anyone, if you have any questions uh, from the LCBO, you can please contact Doug Beatty, who is Ontario's VQA Wine Ambassador, and he's always available to help you answer any questions, uh, certainly with the wines and the wineries that you met in this session. session. So have a great day.